As we discussed previously, the Schrodinger equation is basically the analog of the second law of motion in quantum mechanics. So in the same exact way that we use the second law of motion in classical mechanics to describe the way that our object moves and behaves, in quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation takes the role of helping us describe the motion and behavior of our system on the atomic and subatomic level and it uses something known as the wave function given by the Greek symbol the Greek symbol psi so basically the Schrodinger equation is a differential equation that expresses itself in terms of the wave function as we'll see in just a moment but first let's actually try to understand the role that wave function takes in quantum mechanics. So what exactly does the wave function do in quantum mechanics? So let's go back for just a moment to classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, if we have an object moving, let's suppose along the x-axis in one dimension, to completely describe the motion of that object, all we need to do is calculate two quantities. So if we know precisely what the position is of our object along that x-axis and we know what the momentum is of that object at the same instant in time, then we can use these two quantities to basically determine what the motion of that object be, will be at some future moment in time. So in classical mechanics, position and momentum is needed to sufficiently describe the motion of our object. Now, in quantum mechanics, things aren't so simple. In quantum mechanics, we have the wave-particle duality of nature, and according to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, we cannot precisely know the position of our object as well as the momentum of that object at the same moment in time. So that means in quantum mechanics, we cannot actually use these quantities to describe the motion of our object, and these quantities quantities are basically replaced by a quantity we call the wave function given by the Greek symbol psi. So, in quantum mechanics, the wave function describes the motion and behavior of our object in a similar way, in an analogous way, that position and momentum describe the motion of that object in classical mechanics. So let's suppose we have a certain particle, let's suppose an electron with the mass m that is moving in the positive direction along the x-axis. Now at any given moment in time and point in space, the behavior and the motion of our particle, our electron, is completely given by the wave function. So psi and psi depends on two variables. So the wave function depends not not only on the position along the x-axis, but also on the time. So the wave function is itself a function of two different variables. Now, what exactly does the wave function look like on a two-dimensional page, on the two-dimensional board? So in the same exact analogous way that the position and momentum in classical mechanics can take any real value, for example, it could be one or a million or any number in between, the wave function could take the form of absolutely any continuous function as long as that continuous function can be integrated and squared to get a finite result. So this is one example of our continuous wave function that we can integrate and square to actually get a finite result. Now, the question remains, where exactly do we calculate, how do we calculate, and where exactly do we get the wave function? And this is exactly where the time-dependent Schrodinger equation comes into play. 
So, Schrodinger basically invented this equation to help us determine what the wave function is. So, this equation is known as the one-dimensional time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Time-dependent means the wave function depends not only on our position x, but also on the time. And one-dimensional means we're only considering motion along one dimension, in this case, along the x-axis. Now, notice earlier I said this equation was invented. This equation was not derived. In the same exact way that Sir Isaac Newton invented the second law of motion in classical mechanics, Erwin Schrodinger invented this equation, and then this equation was tested over and over and over again experimentally, and it was basically confirmed that this equation is in fact true. In the same exact way that the equation force equals mass times acceleration was also invented by Sir Isaac Newton and then was tested over and over and over to actually confirm that it was in fact true. So, in the same exact way that force equals mass times acceleration describes the motion of an object in classical mechanics, in quantum mechanics, this equation describes the motion of our object in the atomic and subatomic world using something known as the wave function. So, notice the wave function appears here. On this side, we have the partial derivative of our wave function with respect to time. And on this side, we have the second partial derivative of our wave function with respect to x. Now, on this side, we have mass appearing on the bottom. We have a k term where k is equal to 2 pi divided by the wavelength. And this h bar is simply equal to h Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So this h is equal to 1.055 times 10 to negative 34 joules multiplied by seconds. Now, this is u of x which is basically the potential energy of our particle that is moving along the x-axis and it depends on the position x. And on this side, we also have h-bar as well as an important term that is given by i, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Now, what exactly does this equation actually tell us about the wave function? What information can we extrapolate from this equation about the wave function of our particle moving in quantum mechanics? So, from this equation we see that if we know what the wave function is, at some initial moment in time, let's suppose, at a time of t equals zero seconds, we can use that initial condition to determine the behavior of our particle the, at some future time. That is, if we know what psi x comma zero is, where zero is our time equaling zero seconds, we can predict the future of the motion of the particle to the extent that quantum mechanics allows us to. So, basically, if we are given this equation and we know what our initial condition is, if we know what the wave function of our system is at some initial time of t equals zero seconds, we can then use this equation to calculate what the wave function will actually look like at some future moment in time. Now, let's go back for just a moment to this equation, to the left side of this equation, and let's examine what the meaning is behind the I term that appears in the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. So, what exactly is the meaning behind this I? So, the I is, in fact, an imaginary number. I is equal to the square root of negative 1. And an imaginary number is basically a number that does not exist. It is a number that cannot actually be visualized. The question is, 
how exactly can an imaginary number be part of the equation that describes the motion of objects in quantum mechanics and ultimately the motion of objects in our universe. That is, how can we use a number that does not actually exist to describe the motion of objects that are real and do in fact exist. And here lies the complexity of our quantum, mechanic the quantum mechanical theory. So, in quantum mechanics, matter does not only act as particles, it can also act as waves. So, when objects behave and move in quantum mechanics in the atomic and subatomic level, they do not exactly behave in the same exact way that objects on the macroscopic level in classical mechanics behave. And as a result, there, there are things that we cannot actually understand, we cannot actually picture or actually visualize. And this eye is basically a testament to that idea. You can think of this eye as symbolizing the complexity of quantum mechanics, the complexity of nature, when we get down to the atomic and subatomic world. Now, the question is, how exactly is this equation useful? So, this equation basically incorporates the great complexity of nature, of our universe, such as the quantum theory of energy, as well as the wave-particle duality of matter. Now, this equation, as we'll see in future lectures, explains a great multitude of natural phenomena, such as the production of unique line spectra produced by atoms. In fact, it explains in great detail why certain things take place in the line spectra of atoms. For example, why certain lines appear brighter than other lines. So, what exactly can we conclude from our discussion about this equation? So, the Schrodinger equation basically describes how our universe functions from the microscopic world to the macroscopic world. So when we are dealing with very small things on the atomic and subatomic level, we basically use quantum mechanics to describe the motion of those systems and objects, and we describe them using the wave function. Now the wave function itself can be obtained from the Schrodinger equation, and there are two forms of the Schrodinger equation. We have the time-dependent Schrodinger equation as well as the time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to show how we can use the one-dimensional time-dependent Schrodinger equation to basically solve for the one-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation.